Good morning and welcome to First Light. We are in Genesis chapter 31. And you know what? It is finally time to say goodbye and good riddance to Laban. Man, what a guy. Jacob and all his family and their flocks and all the possessions are fleeing from Laban, the father-in-law. And Laban is angry and he chases Jacob. Uh, chapter 31, verse 22. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his relatives with him, pursued Jacob for seven days, and overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. Now, Gilead is on the eastern border of the promised land. It's on the Jordan River side of things. Verse 24, but God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream at night. Watch yourself, God warned him. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now, if you're not going to say anything bad to somebody, and you're not going to say anything good to him, then what should you do? How about turn around and go home, leave him alone. But that's that's not what he does, obviously. But I want you to notice that in this dream that God is keeping his promise to Jacob to watch over him and care for him. So verse 25, when Laban overtook Jacob, Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country and Laban and his relatives also pitched their tents in the hill country of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? What have you done? Have you deceived? You have deceived me and taken my daughters away like prisoners of war. Why did you secretly flee from me, deceive me and not tell me? I would have sent you away with joy and singing with tambourines and lyres. Now, friends, I think this is a flat-out lie. This is not consistent with who he is. Laban is a swindler and a liar. And Jacob has already tried to leave once, and Jacob wouldn't let him do it. So a common strategy of manipulative people is to always blame something on the other person. Manipulation often comes in the form of anger and heaping guilt on another person, and presenting a wrong and distorted view of reality, to talk about something as if it's this way when it's not that way at all. Well, Laban has asked about his daughters, and then he concludes in verse 30 by mentioning his missing gods. So Jacob answered in verse 31, I was afraid... For I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. Before, um, and if you find your gods with anybody here, he will not live. Before our relatives, point out anything that is yours and take it. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the idols. Now, friends, this is a good example in the Bible of what is commonly called a rash vow. And Jacob just made one. A rash vow is a vow to God that is foolish or it's said in the heat of the moment without much thought as to the words and the consequences of what they mean. Jacob just made a vow that if anyone is caught as anyone has those idols, that person will die. Now, the Bible cautions us about making rash vows. And, and we're encouraged to make vows. We just need to think them through. So, for example, in, in Psalm 50, verse 14, offer a thanksgiving sacrifice to God and pay your vows to the Most High. See, that's a good thing. You make a vow, you do it, you pay it. Verse 61, then I will continually sing of your name, fulfilling my vows day by day. So while there's nothing wrong with vows in and of themselves, they can be very good, just make sure 
It's a good vow and not a foolish vow. Don't make stupid vows. Jacob had no idea that he may have just condemned his wife Rachel to death. Now, probably the most classic example of a rash vow in the Bible is found in the book of Judges chapter 11, verse 28 through 31. The enemy of God's people in this passage is the Ammonites, and the Spirit of God comes upon a man named Jephthah to rise up and defeat the Ammonites. But Jephthah must be feeling a bit uneasy, and he makes a vow, which sounds an awful lot like he's bargaining with God to me. If God will help him, he says, then he will do something for God in return. That's not a very good, you know, God, if you'll do this for me, well, then I'll do something for you. Well, how about you do something for God because he's God, not because you get something, but that's for another lesson. So God, I'm going to do something for you. And what he's going to do is he's going to totally offer to God whatever comes out of his house when he arrives home. Now, this totally offering up to God is a common expression in Hebrew that usually means a burnt offering. And, and what do you suppose he has in mind for this, for this offering to God? Totally dedicated to God. You think he's thinking about a lamb might come out of the house? Uh, maybe a goat? Well, in verse 34, it was his daughter. Friends, don't make dumb vows. Keep the vows that you do make, but don't make a rash vow. Jesus even addressed this in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, Jesus said, Don't swear. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Don't carry on the way other people do. So back to Genesis, Jacob has made a very foolish vow, and he gives Laban permission to search his tents trying to find these gods, these idols. And Laban does. He, he searches the tents, and he cannot find them because Rachel has them. She's got them in a saddlebag uh, that goes on a camel, and she's sitting on the bag. Finally, Laban gives up. And in verse 36, Jacob responds now to Laban, now that Laban's given up and he's finished. And it sounds to me like Jacob has had it. He is so, the common expression today is, he is done with Laban. He's just sick of all this. And he unloads in verse 38. I have been with you these 20 years. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams from your flock. I did not bring you any of the flock torn by wild beasts. I myself bore the loss. Think of it, friends. When an animal was eaten by a lion or a wolf or some other predator, Jacob replaced that animal himself. I bore the loss. I, you demanded payment from me what was stolen by day or by night. If robbers stole a lamb, then Laban demanded that Jacob pay for it because the flock was in his care, we assume. There I was, the heat consumed me by day and the frost by night and sleep fled from my eyes. For 20 years in your household, I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. And you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, had not been with me, certainly now you would have sent me off empty-handed. But God has seen my affliction and my hard work, and he issued his verdict last night, meaning to you in a dream. 
Now, friends, every word, every bit of it that Jacob just said is absolutely true. Every word of it is exactly what happened. Now, listen to Laban's response in verse 43. Then Laban answered Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, the children my children, the flocks my flocks. Everything you see is mine. But what can I do today for these daughters of mine or for the children they have born? And I'm reading this and I think, oh my gosh. Almost every word of that is a lie. It's not true at all. Well, okay, the women are his daughters. That's about all. I mean, all the, he says children, but it's obvious he means the children of these daughters, which would make them his grandchildren. The grandchildren don't belong to Laban. I mean, he's the grandpa, but they belong to Jacob. They're his children. And he's absurdly claiming that all of the flocks belong to him when he and Jacob had an agreement. The speckled ones are his, are Jacob's. A white one or a brown one, those belong to Laban. But speckled and streaked ones and and black ones, those belong to Jacob. And then to to say, everything you see is mine. Do you hear it, friends? Mine, mine, mine. This guy is delusional. He is so sick and twisted and sinful that he actually probably believes these ridiculous things that he's saying. Friends, this, if you haven't grasped it already, this is the family curse in its full boldness passed down from his mama. And I think he got the full dose of it. My goodness alive. This is greed in its fullness. Greed poisons the soul. And notice how it distorts your perception of reality. It clouds your judgment. Friends, if if you've honestly got somebody like that messed up like this in your life, and time has passed, and you've given it some time to try to work it through, to give God a chance and that person a chance to respond to God working in their life, but nothing happens. There may, may come a time when the best solution is to just let go of it, to, to be done with it, to, to, to walk away, to, to separate yourself from such a sick and destructive situation. Now, I know this is a rather extreme um, solution when it involves family members. I I know that. But friends, be honest. This may not apply to your family, but there are some family members like Laban. Twisted, sick, sinful, abusive. But unless Laban surrenders to God over this area of his life, and he hadn't in 20 years, he hadn't in a lifetime, then friends, this is hopeless outside of God. And the only thing that Jacob could expect if he really stayed is more years of abuse and manipulation. In 20 years of dealing with Laban, Jacob has not seen one moment of change from Laban. So, it's time to move on. It's time to move on. God's the one, notice that God's the one who brought this, because remember, God is the one who told uh, Jacob, it's time to leave, you need to leave. And so, God is helping him to do what he needs. He needs to get away from this guy. In the rest of the chapter, they reach a covenant, an agreement, in order to separate. Laban knows he's lost. And so they make an agreement, and the family says goodbye to Laban. After all, the grandchildren are his grandchildren. He kisses them, blesses them, says goodbye, and they part company. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about these years 
as we move to the next chapter tomorrow. Because now Jacob is going home. It's been 20 years. But what's waiting for him at home? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your love and mercy. I thank you that you do watch out for us. And Lord, there are people listening right now. There may be just one or two who might just need to move on. There is some seriously toxic relationship that they've really been struggling with an uh, abusive relationship. And they need wisdom as to know exactly how to deal with it, how, how to maneuver through this, what to do. Lord, I, I pray for healing above all. I pray for healing. I'm praying for wisdom, and I'm praying for mercy and grace. And, and we, we lift up these sick, twisted, abusive people because they need you. And I'm praying that you will get a hold of their lives, that they will come to a moment of repentance and call out and seek you. It is hard to pray for people like Laban's in our lives. But you, Jesus, called us to love our enemies and to pray for those who abuse you spitefully. Well, here's a guy like Laban. And there's others that we know. And so we pray for them. We lift them up to you. And we pray that they would come to a point of deliverance. For we pray this in the great and the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And amen. Have a great day in Jesus. He's given you this day. Live it for him. This is First Light.